You know, it's hard to come up with a new sermon illustration or fresh illustrations week by week. You can only tell so many stories about your life before you run out, especially if your life is shorter than other lives, right? Uh, and if you just talk about yourself all the time, people will think that you're self-absorbed. And so pastors will look for other sources of inspiration for sermon illustrations. And there are websites that have sermon illustrations, and you'll listen to other preachers, and you'll hear, oh, that's a good illustration, and you write it down. And so what you find is there's a lot of borrowing going on, sharing stories, um, and you may have heard a sermon that sounded kind of like another sermon. Maybe it was connected, or maybe it was just because we're all studying the Bible together. But there's a joke among pastors that says there's really been no completely original sermons since the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And the joke is, Peter's sermon, that's the only original one. Ever since then, we've always been copying. Well, I don't know so much about that, but today we do want to take a look at this first sermon, the sermon that launched the church. And I actually borrowed that sermon title from someone else online, because there's only so many titles you can come up with. So before we launch into today's sermon and this first sermon of the Christian era, let's launch into a word of prayer together. Dear Father, as we open your word, we pray that you will inspire us with that same Holy Spirit that was poured out 2,000 years ago. Um, we need a filling. Uh, we need uh, to be used and moved by your Spirit in these last days. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going through the book of Acts, and if you brought a Bible or you can reach the Bible in front of you or you can turn there on some sort of smart device, go to Acts chapter 2, and we're starting now in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. You'll recall last week that we ended with, uh, there was this accusation that the people who had been filled with the Holy Spirit that were now speaking in other languages, they were accused of being drunk. You remember that? And we said, well, that doesn't make sense because they're, they're speaking in new languages that they hadn't learned previously. Well, Peter picks up the, uh, this story in second, or Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and he, it says there, but Peter, standing up with the eleven and the other apostles, including the new one, Matthias, stand up, and he raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. In other words, he said, listen up. Listen up, guys. Verse 15, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. So his argument is, he doesn't get into the fact that drunkenness is clearly condemned in the Bible as a sin. Let that to the side for the moment. He just says, it's only 9 a.m. What's the most logical explanation? It's 9 in the morning. That was the third hour. It started at 6 a.m. and got there till 9 a.m. So the Holy Spirit was poured out, not in the evening or the afternoon. When was the Holy Spirit poured out? In the morning, before 9 a.m. This, this was earlier. So Peter says it's too early, let alone the other reasons he could have given. And then he points them to an Old Testament prophecy. How do we explain this phenomena of people who are speaking with, with joyous jubilation, speaking in other languages that they hadn't previously learned? How can we understand this commotion and the sound that they all heard rushing through their city? He says the prophecy in Joel in the Old Testament is what clearly is, uh, is in reference to this. Verse 16, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes, uh, or very closely quotes, the prophecy from Joel chapter 2. He says there in verse 17, and it shall come to pass in what days? In the last days. Um, biblically speaking, the last days started back in the early Christian church era. Uh, that's when the last days first started. 
God says that I will pour out my spirit upon whom? Only the pastors, right? No. What's it say there? All flesh. That your sons and your who? Daughters shall prophesy, both men and women, boys and girls. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter applies this prophecy to what was happening there in his day. And I think he's right in that partially this prophecy was fulfilled in his day. Uh, but the ultimate fulfillment of these words, I don't think, will come until just before the second coming of Jesus, the full return of the Lord. And so we too expect that there will be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the point is here, he is looking to the Old Testament for an explanation of what was going on in their day. And he says, hey, they're not drunk. It's early in the morning. Actually, fellows, look at the Old Testament. The prophecy predicts that these kinds of things will happen. And then in verse 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words. He's marking a transition in his address. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. It was undeniable that at least it was claimed that Jesus worked many miracles. Uh, they were in Jerusalem. They could just ask anybody. Uh, people all over had seen him heal the blind, raise people like Lazarus from the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. You could talk to anybody. The buzz in the town, everyone knew that at least it was claimed that Jesus was doing these things. And so he says, there's another explanation. And there's this guy named Jesus. God showed a lot of signs and miracles through him, and you are aware of these things. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. God has a purpose, and God knows what's going to happen in the future. It says, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Peter here is speaking some pretty bold words because uh, it probably wasn't the people in the audience there that had directly put Jesus on the cross. But he is applying to the whole nation um, this reality. And perhaps some of those people may have been in the crowd that said, give us Barabbas, crucify him. We don't know exactly. But he says the blame rests here. Um, he was crucified. He was put to death. But verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be held by it. So there was this guy named Jesus. He worked a lot of miracles, but you put him to death. But God raised him up because it was impossible for him to stay in the grave. So first, he points to an Old Testament prophecy saying, we've been expecting the Spirit to be poured out. And then there was this guy that was, that was killed and couldn't stay in the grave. And notice he goes back to the Old Testament, to the words of David. He's using the scriptures familiar to the people to, pull, to prove a point about just who Jesus is and what the explanation for this uh, phenomena was, the Holy Spirit being poured out. He says in verse 25, for, or in other words, because David says concerning him, now, who's the him that David is speaking about, according to Peter? Jesus. So he's saying, David, writing uh, long before, wrote a prophecy about Jesus. It says this, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad 
Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will allow you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. So these words were written by David, but notice what Peter's going to say about these words. Uh, because verse 27 in particular, I want to turn your attention to, it says, you will not leave my soul in Hades. Oh, that's a Greek word for the grave. Uh, don't think of the Greek concept of some place where people are being roasted on a, on a spit or a stick or burning in flames. Uh, in the Bible, this just simply means the grave. So there's somebody who's going to go to the grave, but they won't stay there. And there's somebody who's called the Holy One who won't become corrupt by going into the grave. You see where he's going with this? Who wrote these words originally? David wrote these words in Psalm, right? This is from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And notice his, his conclusion. It's powerful. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely with you. I want to make it plain. Let me speak freely of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and what? He's buried. David is dead. He's buried. And his tomb is with us today. If you doubt it, you can go check out his tomb. Now, I don't think we still know the location of David's tomb, but we know David existed. Uh, there were secular scholars who wanted to diminish the role of David. They say, ah, oh, he didn't have an, an empire, a kingdom, like the Bible says. He, he more have had a, a, a small group of people that were following him around. Well, archaeologists kept on digging and have found evidence that David is probably the guy that the Bible says he was. Well, there's a shocker, right? Not for us. We knew it, and they're digging up evidence that proves this point. And so he says, hey, David is dead. David is buried. You can go check out his tomb if you want to. So what's his implication? His implication is this, this prophecy, these words that David wrote in Psalm 16 could not have been about himself. David was prophesying about someone else. Because David, his body is still in Hades or the grave. His body experienced corruption in the grave. Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, would raise up the Christ and to sit on the throne. The fruit of his body. Jesus is a descendant of David. So he's saying that David was a prophet. And we don't typically think of David in that role. We think of him as a king, as a leader, a guy that messed up big time and repented, uh, someone who wrote a lot of songs. But according to Peter, he's a prophet. And when you think about it, there are prophecies in the Psalms. There are a number of prophecies. And Jesus made it a whole lot more clear um, after he pointed out these things. And so David was a prophet, not in the way that we typically think, but he wrote prophetic words, and he wrote words that indicate that Jesus would be raised again, would raised up to sit on the throne. Verse 31, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in where? Hades, nor his flesh to see what? Corruption. So do you see what he's doing here? It's really quite brilliant. He's speaking to a group of people who've heard this mighty rushing wind sound. They've seen people proclaiming and preaching in the streets and, and speaking with tongues that they don't previously know, languages that they didn't know. And Peter says, this isn't drunkenness. This is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. that The Spirit would be poured out. And this all makes sense because there was this guy named Jesus who died, he was killed by you, but God raised him up because he couldn't die forever. He couldn't stay in the grave, just like David prophesied. And while these verses may not have been obvious before Jesus came, it may not have been explicitly 
uh, a prophecy from their perspective. Once you think about Jesus and how he fulfills these words, you can't see it any other way. He is the fulfillment of David's words here. Verse 32, this God, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. In other words, Jesus ascended, sat down next to God, and he poured out the Spirit as he promised. So how do we explain the things that are going on? He says the only explanation based on prophecy and the facts that you know is that Jesus died, he rose again, he's sitting at the right hand of, uh, of God, and he's poured out the Holy Spirit. That's what we are experiencing. And then he, he quotes one more verse for, in 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens. By the way, for those who think that when we die, we go straight to heaven, here's an an example. Boy, if David couldn't go straight to heaven, what makes the rest of us think that people die and go straight to heaven? Uh, David, David's not in heaven. If he's not there, he was once called a man after God's own heart. You'd think that he would get to go. But David, he's resting. He doesn't know what's going on. He's waiting the resurrection. But David himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is Psalm 110, verse 1. And this is actually the, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. Of all the ones, this one's quoted the most. In fact, the Jews, before this time, they already recognized this psalm as a messianic prophecy, as a prophecy about the Messiah. And Jesus recognized it in the same way. He quoted this as a prophecy about Messiah. And when it says here, the Lord, that's in reference to God the Father, said to my Lord, and this is David writing, so God the Father said to my Lord, David speaking, and well, who's his Lord? Well, this other Lord must be the Son. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God, he assumed the throne in this enthronement ceremony, and he had conquered his enemy. Uh, he'd beaten Satan long before this. He beat Satan on the cross, and someday in the future, he's going to beat Satan once again. Um, when you have your enemies as your footstool in the Eastern culture, this is highly offensive. Uh, and I've said this before, but remember when Saddam Hussein was knocked out of power and and there was this big statue of Saddam that was toppled over. And you could see images of kids in the streets with their sandals hitting that image of Saddam with their shoes. Remember when George Bush was doing a press conference one day uh, and someone threw a shoe at him? It wasn't because they didn't have fruit. It's because that's a highly offensive way. The foot, if you're directing the foot towards someone, that's very offensive. So when it says here that that the enemies will become the footstool. That's saying, you know, you're up on the throne, you've conquered your enemies, and now you're propping your feet up on top of them because you have annihilated them so completely and thoroughly. You getting the picture here? So Jesus, every time he, he fights Satan, he wins. And someday in the future, he's going to eradicate sin, Satan, and all this the problems of our world once and for all. Can you say amen to that? Yes. I'm looking forward to that day. And so Peter says in verse 36, Therefore, based on everything that we've seen and said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This word Lord here is significant. Uh, we've quoted Old Testament prophecies that use the word Lord, uh, a word that was in reference to what we would say is Yahweh or Jehovah. Peter is not just calling Jesus a good person. He is calling him God Almighty and Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
And what's the response? Verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Have you ever felt that in your heart before? You ever felt that conviction of the Holy Spirit? Maybe it was in a sermon or a song, or, or maybe you were just in your house by yourself, and God spoke to you. Don't do that. You need to change your life. Or start doing this. That's powerful. The Holy Spirit has a way to, to get through all the layers that we hide ourselves behind and get to who we really are and speak to us. And the Holy Spirit cut to the heart of these people. And so then they asked the question. What was the question there in verse 37? What should we do? What, what do we do? What do we do now? If you're used to being the one who's the boss of your life and running your life, and you, you come to a point when you realize, the way I've been running my life hasn't worked, you might find yourself asking, God, what do I do now? Find your heart open to taking the suggestions of the Holy Spirit. And Peter had a really good response. Verse 38, he said to them, what's that first word? It starts with an R. Repent. Now, what does it mean to repent? Confess. It's stronger than just that, though. Eric, exactly. Turn away from your sins. You're heading towards sin. You're living a life of sin. Repentance means I'm doing a U-turn. I'm going away from the way I was going before. Turning away from your sins. Not just asking for forgiveness, but turning away. And by the way, we're also told in Scripture that repentance is a gift from God. Of ourselves, we wouldn't ever want to repent. And so while the Holy Spirit had been poured out, it was the Holy Spirit that was working before this extra filling uh, to lead and guide. Repent. Turn away from the things that you're doing wrong that you know are wrong. And what's the second part he says? And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He's telling them, you've become convicted and convinced that Jesus is Messiah. Turn from your sinful ways and accept Jesus. Be baptized in his name and become a Christian. These are foundational things. Repentance and baptism. Baptism is a way of demonstrating your repentance. Going down to the water, saying, I'm dying to the old way. I'm repenting from the old way of living, and I'm getting Jesus to wash away my sins, and I'm being raised to a new way of life. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then what do you get? The gift of the Holy Spirit. That had just been poured out that, that very morning. Now, he wasn't necessarily promising that, that tongues of fire were going to descend on those believers, but he was saying, you're going to get a special blessing from the Holy Spirit. And everybody who is born into the kingdom of God is born as a missionary. And to accomplish our mission, we have to have help because we can't do it on our own. And so God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us. Verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Uh, this promise extends to us too today. This promise is for us. Um, we need repentance today. We need baptism. If you haven't been baptized, you need to start praying and asking God about baptism and preparing for baptism. And we need the Holy Spirit, not just once, but every single day. By the way, this is not the, the entirety of Peter's sermon. What does verse 40 tell us? Verse 40 says, he said a lot of other things too. We only got some of the highlights, but maybe in heaven we'll get to watch the DVR version of Peter's sermon. It will be awesome. He said many other things, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Do you think that 
that this generation might be even more perverse than it was back then? Yeah. The evil is just so prevalent. You're not even looking for it, and it just it comes to you. We need the Lord's help day by day. Verse 41, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, how many people were added to the Lord? 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in, in four things. In the apostles' doctrine, in the teaching of the apostles, and in fellowship, koinonia, that's that Greek word for close association and sharing together. Breaking of the bread, that's a reference to the Lord's Supper, and also just eating together, hanging out together, and in prayers. Boy, if you want four ingredients to improve your spiritual life, these four things are powerful. we got to be solid in the teachings of the Bible. Amen? Steadfastly continue in it. It helps guard us from deception, guard us from the enemy's attacks. And in fellowship. I am so happy that we can do live streaming and that those who are not able to make it can watch and can be blessed by our service. Uh, and I'm so glad that people can come here and, and enjoy the service. But, but we don't do these things simply to make ourselves feel better about our Sabbath day. We do it because we want to get into the Word, right? And we also want to experience fellowship. And if you're at home, uh, you can fellowship by calling people up on the phone this afternoon. You can text someone, although I think voice calls are even better, and you can do some fellowship on the phone, um, or you can do FaceTime, which is even uh, another step. And if you're here, uh, I encourage you, before you leave, say hi to at least one person. A couple people. Talk to them a little bit. We're here not just to listen, but to study and to fellowship, to have this close association together. Breaking of the bread. Well, we break bread with potluck every other week, but I'd encourage you to break bread together even outside. You know, it's, it is legal to invite other members over to your house for lunch. It's allowed. There's nothing in the church manual against it. In fact, it would be encouraged. And it's actually okay to see other Adventists not on Sabbath. Did you know that? You can, you can text or call someone up and say, hey, why don't we go grab some food together? Why don't you come on over to my house? Or I'm not really that much of a cook, but let's go to your favorite restaurant. And we'll go Dutch treat, you know. You pay for yours, I'll pay for mine. Uh, or just hang out. If we want to be together and encourage each other, we need to do things outside of the scheduled church activities. Amen? It's okay to start your own small group. If you, want, if you want to start a small group, I would love to see more small groups. We have at least five small groups that meet, uh, but I'd like to see more in our church. This is more of how the New Testament church worked. They worked in small groups. Uh, that's how they worked. If you want to start something in your home, I will train, I'll help you get training and support and, and whatever you need. We need these four things, continuing in the apostles' doctrine, fellowshipping together, breaking bread together, and in prayer. A church that prays together stays together. People that pray together grow together. And the result of all this, verse 43, the fear came upon all soul, a holy respect and awe came upon them. And there were many wonders and signs that were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and they had all things in common and they sold their possessions and their goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about tithe and offering and how really it's all God's anyways? This is living it out in action. They realized, you know, everything we have is God's, so if somebody else in the church needs something, I'm going to give it to them. Um, they, they, they were so convicted of that. So continuing, verse 46, daily with one another, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This is a very happy time 
in the early Christian church. Wouldn't you agree? I want, to, I want these words to be true about us, too. Uh, to be a church that, that seeks each other out intentionally, outside of services, that fellowships together, that studies together, that prays together, that does service together, uh, and that grows God's kingdom here in the greater Modesto area together. Is that your desire? Everybody can do something. Everyone can do something. Well, I think it's very fitting for us to end on that question. What shall we do? What shall we do? And there are two specific things, remember, that, that Peter said. He told the people back then to do, and I think it's two things that are very important for us to do. Number one, repent. Is there anything, and, and I have no idea what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, but is there anything that God wants you to stop doing or start doing? Because uh, repentance can be not just turning from bad things, but it can be turning from something good to something even better as the Holy Spirit leads. Is there anything that God wants you to stop doing or start doing. Have some serious prayer with God about that in your heart. Whatever God says, do it. Or don't do it. <laughs> the thing that he tells you not to do. But you won't regret it. And if there are people here today that haven't yet been baptized, uh, haven't yet begun the process of, of starting to get ready for baptism, and I know the Lord works at different times and in different ways, um, I would encourage you to act on that today. If the Lord's speaking to you today, talk to me afterwards. Talk to someone else afterwards. Um, we can help connect you um, with someone who can study the Bible with you if you need that and start preparing you to enter the waters of baptism here. So having said these two things, I'm just going to have a word of prayer and let the Holy Spirit continue to speak to us, and give us the courage to follow his voice today. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we are so glad that you didn't leave us in our sins, hopeless, lost forever. Jesus, you came down, you lived a perfect life, you died a perfect death, and your body couldn't be contained in the grave, and, and it was raised up again. And Lord, we just are so thankful for the gift of salvation, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for the gift of repentance. Speak to our hearts today. We want to be more like you. If there are things that we've been doing that we need to stop doing, Lord, give us the strength through your Holy Spirit to follow you. And if there are good things that we need to start doing that we haven't been doing, again, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. Give us your Spirit so that we can say yes and follow you in these areas. And finally, Lord, if there's anyone who you want to lead to the waters of baptism soon, I pray that you will give them courage and that you will give them conviction to follow your voice in this wonderful and joyous celebration of what you've been doing in their life. So we pray all this and we thank you, not in our name, but in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ. Let everyone say, Amen.